So Dr. Doom fights Kane the Conqueror and Mephisto in this story, and it's amazing. Okay, so check this out. So this initially picks up with something called the Antleon Collider, which is basically a black hole that's being created on the dark side of the moon. It's more of a controlled black hole. It's basically a minor singularity. But the reason why this is done is because the world, or at least the scientific community on Earth in the Marvel Universe, wants to start shifting more towards like nuclear power, different things like that. But with all the different forms of energy that are used, the big question that people find themselves asking is what do we do with all this waste right this energy waste that we end up creating is it one of these things where we're going to just kind of keep on doing what we're doing which is driving to the side of a hill dumping our trash in the ground and then covering it up or are we going to come up with something that's a little more elegant and more befitting of our technological advancement and so that's the idea behind this black hole is to literally create a place whereby trash can be dumped essentially for infinity, right? Because black holes will break everything down on the atomic level and it may end up filling up, but I mean, it's it would take an astronomically long amount of time in order for that to happen. The kicker to all this is that while these interviews are being done with members of the, the Antleon Collider community, they're also talking to Dr. Doom and they ask him the question like, what's your stance on this? Of course, Dr. Doom being Dr. Doom is like, it's gonna fail, right? This whole thing's being done by Reed Richards. As intelligent as he is, the biggest problem Reed Richards has is that he's sloppy and because he's sloppy this is going to end up failing disastrously now the crazy thing about this is that you do have this guy named Steve who's one of the guys conducting the interview right one of these reporters and he literally says many believe that you're just upset because you were left out on the project and it has to be a failure because you weren't involved now here's the thing right anybody who knows anything about Dr. Doom in Marvel Comics knows that there are some things you just don't say right like Pick your battles wisely. This is one of those because when the interview ends, Dr. Doom just kind of leaves in a huff and then tells one of his guys, bring the reporter Steve to me. Bring that guy to me, right? Like, I want my hands on that guy. He's been mouthing off and we need to help Steve understand his place in the bigger picture. And so one of the things that kind of goes on here and it's cool is that while that's taking place, you end up having Dr. Doom in his study. And while he's there, he's suddenly met by the arrival of Kang the Conqueror. Now, when it comes to Kang and Dr. Doom, this is one of those things where it's kind of, you stay away, I stay away, right? In the sense that because these two guys are kind of distant relations to a degree, Kang doesn't really do a whole lot in terms of intentionally going after Victor Von Doom. The reason for that is that in Marvel Comics, it's never been fully established if Kang the Conqueror is the descendant of Reed Richards or the descendant of Victor Von Doom. But the risk here, and even Kang himself doesn't fully know, if he were to attack Doctor Doom and he were to kill him, he could actually prevent his own existence from happening. And so he doesn't really go directly against Doctor Doom and usually pick a fight, although the two have fought in the past. And the fights between Doctor Doom and Kang are usually amazing. Like, they're some of the coolest fights you're ever going to see. Mostly because it's Kang the Conqueror brandishing all his technology and time travel escapades, and it's Doctor Doom with just, like, the best one-liners ever in the history of comic books. It's phenomenal. No, no, I will say Apocalypse has better one-liners, but Doctor Doom has great one-liners. He's got great lines, but it's just one of those things. But it's also because of the fact that Doctor Doom is so astronomically intelligent, and because he's so capable, and because his lust for power in a lot of ways mirrors that of Kang, there is a kind of respect that has grown between the two, also because of the fact they've helped each other at different points in time. And so Kang being here is one of those things where it's a little mysterious. We don't really know why he's here in the first place. The nature of the conversation is really more just kind of banter back and forth between the two, and that's basically it. And then Kang ultimately just sort of teleports away. But what Dr. Doom ends up doing is as he prepares for bed, that he actually ends up having this vision of a woman that we haven't discovered yet, and she and Dr. Doom have a family, right? Like they have a whole full on family. And so Dr. Doom really kind of going back to his quarters right after this sort of hallucination, which really even takes him by surprise, he ends up opening the door only to find that he's on the moon where the entire Antleon project has gone awry. According to his prediction, it's manifested a full scale black hole and is sucking everything in around it. Now, here's the thing to understand. If a black hole opened on the moon, it, we would die so fast, we wouldn't even be able to understand what had happened, right? Like, literally, it would just probably be a flash of light, and, like, that's it. That's all we would see. But the thing about this is that once Dr. Doom, of course, the next morning, he's basically told, hey, we have Steve, that uh, he ends up going to find where Steve is basically just kind of strung up. <laughs> and he's like, make sure he's fed today. 
tomorrow we might not feed him, but today make sure he's fed. And so as Dr. Doom is kind of meditating and focusing on this vision that he received, suddenly the nuclear arms of, of Latveria fire off, right? They literally just start going off. Like all these nuclear weapons of Latveria shoot off. They head toward the Antileon, uh, Antileon Collider and basically destroy the whole thing. And because they, um, because they originated from Latveria and because Dr. Doom had been like, yeah, man, uh, this, the whole, this whole thing's going to fail. The immediate suspect for all of this is Dr. Doom. And these guys come swooping in, right? Just, I mean, it's, it's, it's shoot out of the okay corral, right? Guns blazing. The first one to show up here is Union Jack. He doesn't really matter all that much, but he is cool, right? He's one of these characters where he never really gets a whole lot of appearances in Marvel Comics, but he is cool and it is interesting to see him from time to time. But the funny thing about this is that while this attack's going on, suddenly Victor Von Doom is shot by Agent Zero. Now, Agent Zero is a lot more capable. Maverick was one of the original inductees into the Weapon X program alongside Wolverine. So while he's not necessarily on the same level as Wolverine regarding like adamantium bonding and all that kind of stuff he is probably one of the single greatest assassins and mercenaries in the entirety of the marvel universe it's crazy how good he is and he even goes as far as to say interpol's reward right the international police their reward just shot up for victor von doom like literally everybody's got it out for this guy everybody's coming for this guy and so where dr doom is able to initially get the upper hand on both union jack as well as uh, as well as maverick he had instructed his staff immediately issue a surrender right immediately tell them we're surrendering here because the worst thing we can do is to actually face off against these forces because what it does is it implies guilt right like it would it would indicate like yes we launched the attack and i'll be damned if anybody's going to come to latveria and give me you're you're never going to take me alive, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing, right? And so ultimately, he ends up basically just surrendering to various forces that show up here. Now, once he's taken, he's actually brought in by a combination of different things. The first two are Silver Sable and Amy Chen. Now, these two are particularly important, but only in certain circles in Marvel Comics. So Silver Sable runs a group called the Wild Pack, which is one part information brokering and one part mercenary work. So they are guys that basically they travel the world, they pick up people who are supposed to be picked up by various government governmental agencies or corporations or what have you, but because Silver Sable is networked with so many different organizations and groups out there, she's basically a person tied into a ton of information. So even if she's not necessarily coming after you, if somebody else is coming after you, they can actually hit up Silver Sable. And if they're able to offer the right price, she'll give them the information that they need. The other person that's brought here is Dr. Stephen Strange. Now, the reason why Stephen Strange is here is one, because this story takes place before he died. And two, because as most people who are familiar with Doctor Doom in Marvel Comics know, Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange have a very strong history together. The most notable instance of the two of them working together was when they traveled to basically the realm of Mephisto, they traveled to hell, and the story Triumph and Torment in order to free Doctor Doom's mother from, from Mephisto, right? To free her soul so it could go to heaven, which they successfully did. And in fact, that's something that I want you to keep in the back of your mind, because we'll talk about that again in this story. But Dr. Doom's various mystical abilities are enough that they can match the powers of Dr. Doom. So if you want to try some crazy, you know, Jedi mind trick mysticism stuff, Dr. Doom would be there to basically bring it to an end. But as we know, Dr. Doom has no real intention of doing that. Now, the irony behind all this, and this is the important thing to understand, based on the visions that Dr. Doom has been getting, which he doesn't really know the origin of it, and we don't really even know the origin of it at the moment is that these visions indicate somewhere along the line dr doom does something which ushers in an era of peace all across the world and literally brings a kind of utopia that had never been seen before. And so that's why Dr. Doom, one, allows himself to surrender because he's kind of curious about where these visions are leading, but two, Kang the Conqueror suddenly appears inside this ship where Dr. Doom's at. And it's one of those things where literally Kang's like, I've seen your future, right? Years from now, you're the magnanimous leader of an eternally peaceful Earth, and it would be the most preferable Earth 
for me to conquer. And so that's kind of the on-running theme, like Kang the Conqueror will appear more over the course of the story. And really, if anything, he kind of shows up. I mean, Doctor Doom does fight him a couple times, but he shows up more often than not in order to help Doom because he's like, the things that you're going to do are basically going to make the Earth a, a utopia, but it's also going to make the Earth weaker and it makes it easier for me to conquer. So like, here's some stuff to help you because in helping you, I'm helping myself, right? Like That's really much what he does for a good chunk of the story. And it's hilarious the times that he shows up. It's funny. But one of the things that Doom says is, okay, if this future you see is true and it matches the visions that I've been having, then free me, right? Like if you want to be able to conquer the earth in the future because of what I'll end up doing, then free me and get me out of here. And so one of the things that they do is they sabotage the, the engines of the vessel and then they basically escape. Now, you guys are probably asking yourself, why don't they just teleport out of it? The reality is when you're dealing with Kang, Marvel plays it fast and loose, right? If Kang basically destroyed or, or, or sabotaged the engines, it's because in looking over all the different timelines, it's the only one where they successfully escape. That's kind of the undercurrent that Marvel uses, right? Like Kang does everything he does for a particular reason. But the reality is that once this is done, basically Kang teleports away and Doctor Doom casts a mysticism in order to save himself. Following that, he literally goes underground. He dons a kind of mask and hides himself and he takes off to the city of New York. Now, when he gets there, he basically ends up encountering what are these sort of visions of Morgan Le Fay. Now, these visions come in the form of her appearing in like Times Square on TV screens, different things like that. Only Doctor Doom can see her. This is one of those elements of Marvel Comics that's really cool. Morgan Le Fay has been around for an exceedingly long time. And in fact, she's been around about the same time as Merlin in Marvel Comics. And the thing about this is she actually originates from Atlantis, or at least the Atlantean territories, before the Great Cataclysm during the Second Host, when the Celestial showed up and then attacked the Deviants. That is to say, she's been around for thousands of years and she's incredibly powerful. She's not the most powerful person ever, but it's kind of a loose knit family between like her and Dr. Doom and Dr. Strange and like the Scarlet Witch and Brother Voodoo, people like that. Just these people that practice like magic and mysticism, which is really weird when you think about it because like there was a time when Morgan Le Fay and Dr. Doom banged. So that's kind of cool. But the thing about this is that while all that's going on, what you end up having is Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. While it's off panel, he comes to the realization that if Dr. Doom has actually escaped and Dr. Doom's out there on the lam, then what they need is someone who's every bit as intelligent as Dr. Doom, meaning this person is one, it like kind of shares the number one spot for the smartest person in the Marvel Universe, but is also immensely powerful. Powerful enough that they can stand toe to toe with Dr. Doom. And so what you end up having is Herbie the robot, who's kind of like the robotic assistant of the Fantastic Four, basically traveling to Cornell and meeting with Adam Brashear and bringing Adam Brashear in as a person that can actually capture Dr. Doom. Now, a lot of people are going to ask the question, how in the world is it that like Blue Marvel is on the same level as Dr. Doom? Is this just something you're making it up, Rob? I'm not making this up at all. And the reason why I say that is because there's a point when Blue Marvel is meeting with uh, with Herbie. And, you know, at that point, you know, Blue Marvel's like, okay, so Reed Richards is finally taking me seriously. And Herbie's like, well, you were the top available, right? Like you were just, you were the next best choice, <laughs> which is kind of a crappy way to put it. But then Herbie also goes on to say, you match Dr. Doom in intellect and strength, especially since he's without his powers. Now, the way that Herbie's drawing this information is based on the information that Reed Richards has in his database. What that means is that in Marvel Comics, what Christopher Cantwell is establishing here, that Reed Richards is one, well aware of who Adam Brashear is, which is something that we already knew. And then two, looking at Adam Brashear, the Blue Marvel, top to bottom, from his intelligence to his strength, to his powers and so on, Reed has basically established that Blue Marvel is as intelligent and capable as Doctor Doom. What this means is that Blue Marvel shares the number one spot as the smartest person in the world with Reed Richards, Doctor Doom, and Valeria Richards, right? It's a really cool moment. This is one of those things that you're probably gonna see people referencing when other folks ask the question, where does Blue Marvel reside in terms of intelligence, strength, so on and so forth. And so following this, what you end up doing is 
picking back up with Doom while he's traveling with Morgan Le Fay, and they travel to meet a guy called The Witness. Now, this is the one and only appearance of The Witness, at least in this form that I'm aware of in Marvel Comics, but the idea behind this guy is he can basically look into the eyes of another person and then see exactly what their future is. And what The Witness says is that Doctor Doom is going to die, and it's the saddest day on Earth. It's absolutely beautiful, but we don't really find out exactly how this death happens, but what it does seem to do is kind of fall in line with the visions that Dr. Doom's been having, where he becomes this person that literally saves the world, then it would be a tragic and sad day because the world would have lost somebody significant to them. The kicker is that before any of this goes down and any other questions can be asked, Dr. Doom is killed on the spot and he's actually assassinated and the person who takes him out is none other than Taskmaster Tony Masters. I told you this story gets amazing. Now again, in this moment, what ends up happening is because Dr. Doom is by all standards of measurement dead, he wakes up in hell. He wakes up in the realm of Mephisto and traveling there, he basically dons this kind of hell armor, which I gotta tell you guys, is probably the second most badass Dr. Doom's ever looked. The only thing better than this was when he was God King Doom. So he basically had his normal outfit, but it was all white, which was dope. And I'm surprised no one's cosplayed as God King Doom at any Comic Cons. It kind of astounds me, but this looks Dope. Oh my god, like it looks so beast. But what ends up happening is Dr. Doom comes face to face with Mephisto. Now the thing about this is Dr. Doom tells him right off the bat, I'm not supposed to be here. And the response of Mephisto is, that's what they all say. But I'm glad to have your, your soul now and forever. And Dr. Doom immediately attacks Mephisto. Now, here's the thing to understand about Mephisto, right? This guy, it's a misnomer when it comes to how powerful Mephisto is. With, with Mephisto himself, he is at the peak of his power when he's in his own realm. But he's not indestructible and he's not unstoppable. But the thing about this is that Dr. Doom is immensely powerful. The reality here is Dr. Doom's not powerful enough to overcome Mephisto, to beat him in his own realm like this. And so what kind of goes on here is a bit of bouncing back and forth where Mephisto starts playing games with Dr. Doom. Now, one of the things that I want to establish here, and it's really kind of more of a background of what's taking place, is that you do have the kingdom of Latveria where Dr. Doom normally resides. What you have next to it is a place called Simkaria. And Simkaria has kind of been a war-torn place for quite some time. Only recently has it actually established any measure of an organized government. And so what's going on here is that Simkaria is actually organizing battle formations and they're in the process of trying to conquer Latveria while Dr. Doom is not there. So that's an important plot point to keep in mind. Again, we're not going to be talking a lot about that, but we will talk about it at the end because it does become incredibly important at the end of this. But the thing about this, kind of focusing on the here and now, what Mephisto does is he tells Dr. Doom if you you can convince Valeria that you deserve to live, then you can return to your life. Now, here's the thing. Valeria, there's two different ones. There's Valeria Richards, who's the daughter of Reed Richards, and then there's a different Valeria. So, no, we're not talking about, you know, Valeria Richards, right? This 11-year-old kid that Dr. Doom was in love with. That's weird, right? That's weird and creepy and really, really gross. Valeria is a character who's exceedingly old school in Marvel Comics. And in fact, she goes all the way back to Marvel Super Heroes number 20 in 1969. Valeria Valeria was a person who lived in the same camp that Dr. Doom did when he was a little kid. They were basically, you know, they, they kind of fell in love as teenagers as much as anybody could. But as Dr. Doom became consumed by vengeance and power, Valeria basically left him behind, right? She just didn't want to be a part of that life. And as a result of that, she eventually fled. Dr. Doom caught up to her and basically convinced her that he was going to leave all that madness behind. And all he wanted was her love and a life. And so she ultimately bought into it. What was really going on in probably one of the most just amazing stories that Mark Raid ever wrote in the Fantastic Four back in volume three, back in 2003. The idea here is that what Dr. Doom had done is he had actually tricked Valeria and he effectively sold her soul behind her back so that he could attain mystical armor, right? Enhance his powers. And so when that happened, her soul was sent to the realm of Mephisto. It was a pretty shady thing to do. And that's why Mephisto makes this claim. If you can convince the only only woman in the world who ever loved you, that you betrayed her, that you deserve life, then I will give it to you. And that's the crazy thing is Victor Von Doom tries to do it. And he even tries to rationalize his actions. No, 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 no. I needed that because I'm going to make the world a better place.
place. I'm gonna make the world a, a way more interesting place. Your your soul, right? Eternal damnation for you. That was a sacrifice I was willing to make in order to make that happen, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The reality here is he's not really apologetic for it. And so in spewing all this stuff about everything he's seen, suddenly you end up having Valeria that transforms into a demon, really in like really Mephisto, this kind of been impersonating her and then like really tormenting Dr. Doom. And it's like, I've seen this life that you say you've seen Dr. Doom. I see how you save everything and so on and so forth. You're never going to attain it. That's going to be your damnation here, right? Your eternal torment is going to be that you know without a shadow of a doubt that your one dream in this world actually comes true, that you become this leader of, a, of this earth, you lead it into utopia, you become everything that you believe yourself to be, and you're never going to be able to attain it. That's going to be your hell. And so literally a fight breaks out between the two, and it's pretty knocked down drag out. But in the middle of all this, Mistress Death appears and is like, done, this fight's over, right? He will return to his life, Mephisto. Now here's the thing, even Mephisto himself, regardless of any level, his, uh, level of power he has, is not stupid enough to fight Mistress Death. She's the literal living embodiment of death. All she has to do is will it and Mephisto ceases to exist. That's it. I mean, that's literally what you're talking about here. So not even he is stupid enough to invoke her ire. And the funny thing about this is that where Dr. Doom asks, right? Like, are you doing this so that I can truly go back to earth and become the person that saves it? And her response is no, it's because you will become my greatest servant of all. You will bring a level of death and destruction that the world has never seen. It's a crazy thing because what ends up happening is that after this whole circumstance arrives or really ends, that Dr. Doom wakes up in the home of Morgan Le Fay, who had taken his body back to her apartment. And of course, the two of them are joined by uh, by Blue Marvel. Now, as soon as Dr. Doom sees Adam Brashear, he immediately fires on him and gets him out of there because Dr. Doom knows how powerful Adam Brashear is. He knows how capable he is. And if a true knockdown drag out fight between the two happens, that given his current circumstance, it's highly unlikely that Dr. Doom will be able to overpower Adam Brashear and basically keep him from, from being a Arrested, right? So that's why he literally sends him flying in the moment to just sort of get him out of the way. At that point, yet again, Kane the Conqueror pops up. <laughs> Kane the Conqueror appears. And it's one of those things where it's kind of an information brokering, right? At that point, Dr. Doom's like, okay, Kang, I need you to rattle your brain. I need you to tell me what timelines there are where I was successfully killed in this moment here and now. Not five days ago, right? Not 50 minutes ago, at this moment right now, right? I need to know who it was that killed me. And the response of Kang is, it was Taskmaster and he was hired by Advanced Idea Mechanics. And so what literally ends up happening here is Dr. Doom finds the base of advanced idea mechanics, right? He literally breaks in, he steals their weapons and starts shooting the place up. He kills everyone, right? He does, he, like every single soldier they have, they all die. Now, here's the thing. I had previously stated that Dr. Doom without his powers is basically useless. I was wrong, right? I was 100% wrong. Unlike most people on the internet, I can admit when I'm wrong, when I'm, when I think I'm wrong. Unfortunately, I usually never think I'm wrong. So I usually never admit when I am wrong. Just kidding. But here's one of the things, right? I never really considered Dr. Doom to be capable when he didn't have his arms and armament. This dude's a beast, man. This guy's rolling through here with just the, with just the biggest gun I've ever seen killing everyone he sees, right? Just overpowering them all. He duplicates himself several times over and all those different forces, right? All those different versions of himself start attacking all these different soldiers. So we still use those powers to a degree, but at the end of the day, it comes down to him and Taskmaster. Now, this is when you really get to see what Dr. Doom is capable of. I never believed he was good when it came to hand-to-hand -hand combat, mostly because you never really see him doing hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's always like, you know, I'm Dr. Doom and magical spells and just badassery all over the place. That's usually all you ever see. But seeing him facing off against Taskmaster like this and overcoming Tony Masters is impressive as hell, right? It's a pretty, pretty cool thing because remember, when you're fighting against Taskmaster, you're not just fighting Tony Masters, you're fighting everyone Tony Masters has ever fought, right? So you're fighting Captain America, Spider-Man, Deadpool, Wolverine, like all these different characters because it's, it's a Rolodex. He just pulls those fighting styles out. And depending on the circumstance, especially when he was fighting Black Panther, he actually merged all those fighting styles into one to where he would punch like Captain America, but he would die 
dodge like Spider-Man, and he would kick like Deadpool. It was cool, man. It was just, it was just one of the coolest things. Just, just some amazing moments that you see in Marvel Comics. And so once Doctor Doom gets the upper hand on Taskmaster, knowing that Taskmaster's mission was quote unquote finished with Doctor Doom, the next thing he wants to know is, who are you supposed to go after next, right? Because he literally asked him, who hired advanced idea mechanics to kill me, right? That's what I want to know. Who hired them to take me out? Who hired you to take me out? And where he initially won't give that explanation, the reality here is Dr. Doom's smart enough to know that if Taskmaster is going after Dr. Doom, then Taskmaster is also going after people associated with Dr. Doom. And so that's when he's like, I want to know who this is. Who is it you're supposed to go after next? And that's when he says, it's Frazina, right? It's a woman named Frazina. And at that moment, Dr. Doom basically ends up realizing there's a much bigger thing going on here and immediately goes after that chick, right? Immediately goes after Frazina. Now, the other thing that takes place here is kind of working his ranks up, right? Basically continuing to take out Taskmaster as well as what seemingly the rest of Advanced Idea Mechanics. He's met by the arrival of MODOK. Now, MODOK doesn't really offer much of the way of a challenge here for Dr. Doom. He kind of does, but he kind of doesn't. He tries to shoot him with like a mental blast. Dr. Doom has the shield of Taskmaster and his sword. He just stabs MODOK in the chest. But this killing is also a long time coming because remember, MODOK was part of intelligence which was the organization that stripped Dr. Doom of his intelligence. If you're not familiar with that storyline, we're actually covering it right now in my videos on Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four. So we'll post a link to that video down in the playlist. But in the midst of all this, you end up picking up on Liberty Island. Now, Liberty Island is a place that has these kind of weather stations that are being created or being used by this woman named Frazina. And the idea behind this is it's basically an attempt, even if only in a smaller localized space, to basically control weather. In Marvel Comics, that kind of stuff happens all the time. It's not really a new thing. It's not really landmark. It's just something that Christopher Cantwell's throwing in here to show what she's doing. But in the midst of all this, one of the things that we learn is she is from Latveria. And we know this because there are discussions that take place with, between her and the people around her where they ask questions like, you know, is Doctor Doom really an effective leader? You know, is it a good thing that he's gone? That kind of stuff. And she's like, understand, right? The law of sedition and rendition. Those individuals who speak ill of Latveria and its leader, especially Latverian citizens, will literally be tossed in some kind of a re-education camp. I don't want to be one of those guys, so I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing, right? That kind of a thing. It's just kind of bred into them in terms of how they function. The other part of this here is that while you do have Dr. Doom in a library who's basically reading up on Frazina, the reason why this name is so significant comes when he's visited by Kang the Conqueror yet again. And when, when the, the two of them really start talking, it's Dr. Doom saying, in these visions that I had, the woman that I end up marrying is Frazina. Like that's the person that I end up marrying and that I end up having a life with. So the reality is if she's a target of advanced idea mechanics and they're looking to kill her by using Taskmaster or somebody, I've got to find a way to keep her alive. She's supposed to end up becoming my wife. And so this is a really significant moment here. And there's actually history between Dr. Doom and Frisina indirectly. And the reason why this happens is because you do have a little bit of a skirmish that takes place between Dr. Doom and Kane the Conqueror. But the significance of this really comes in the form of the fact that when Dr. Doom ends up visiting Frisina, she initially rebukes him, right? I mean, at first she's kind of like, oh my God, it's Lord Dr. Doom, you know, that kind of a thing. But once the veil goes away and he tells her, just address me like a regular person, she doesn't like him. And in fact, she hates him because he tells her like, I've had visions and you and I are supposed to get married, which is one way to propose, right? Just like run up on a random chick. Hey, random woman over there. I've had visions. We're supposed to get married. Uh, you want to get hitched, right? I mean, that's not going to work. <laughs> but the reason why Frazina hates Dr. Doom is because there was a point during Doom War when Dr. Doom had invaded Wakanda and stole its vibranium that a journalist in Latveria had spoken out against Dr. Doom because of that. And what Dr. Doom had done is he had jailed that guy basically for, for sedition, right? For speaking ill of Latveria and of Dr. Doom. And that guy is still serving a prison sentence. That guy is the father of Frazina. And that's why she hates Dr. Doom because the guy was just doing his job and the price he paid is, is basically a life of imprisonment. And even Dr. Doom goes as far as to say, I should have had your father executed for what he did. Just be happy in the fact that I didn't. And I was feeling particularly generous. Now that's the most Dr. Doom thing to say, <laughs> to be honest with you. But in the midst of all this, a couple things happen. The first is that you basically have the arrival of Adam Brashear alongside Herbie. And then you have the arrival of Silver Sable and Victorious. Now, 
I've kind of held off on talking about them up to this point. The way things had played out with their characters is that Victorious was kind of like the second in command to Doctor Doom. Whenever he's not in Latveria, she's the one who runs the show. And so where you basically had the Simkarians who were attempting to invade Latveria, successfully did so, and then took over the country, that Victorious was basically ousted. But the other part of this is that Silver Sable, being as smart as she is, had realized something else is going on here, and she was actually being used. And so she and Victorious worked together to try to find Doctor Doom, so they could basically put all their information together and figure out what the bigger picture is. Now, of course, Blue Marvel being here is just for the purpose of trying to, you know, to, to grab Doctor Doom. And it's really an amazing moment because a fight breaks out between the two and Adam Brashear holds his own against Doctor Doom. And that's one of the things that I hope you notice here. In terms of Doctor Doom facing off against uh, against Blue Marvel, it's really him just trying to hold off the power of Adam Brashear. And this is due to the fact that in this moment, Doctor Doom is not as powerful as Adam Brashear. It's a pretty cool moment, right? It's a pretty cool and badass thing where literally Blue Marvel is more powerful than Doctor Doom in this moment. Now, of course, yet again, Kane the Conqueror shows up. <laughs> I told you he would show up at like the funniest moments and at the most inopportune times. What's really cool though is that this is an exceedingly opportune time. He shows up here with just this insane weapon and it's like, okay, Dr. Doom, this is for you because remember, you gotta live so that you can make the world easier to conquer for me. You're like, I told you that's his whole motivation is showing up here strictly for that. And in fact, what you end up having is Adam Brashear who immediately attacks Kane the Conqueror because Kane the Conqueror destroys Herbie. And so in that moment, Adam Brashear, like the Blue Marvel, kills Kane the Conqueror, right? He kills him on the spot, just incinerates that guy. And that's when Doctor Doom's like, okay, yeah, we got to get out of here. Like, we got to find a way to bail. The other part of this, though, is that no one's prepared for what comes next. Because what happens here is that with Kane the Conqueror, it wasn't simply just a weapon that he gave Doctor Doom. What he also gave him was an advanced suit of armor from his own timeline, right? From Kane's own timeline. In doing that, what it does is it restores Victor Von Doom back to his full power. He's got the full brunt of his technology combined with his mysticism and advanced weaponry from Kane the Conqueror. Blue Marvel's like, look, here's the thing, Doom. We have to put these grievances aside. This black hole is going to emerge. Everything's going nuts with the Antleon Collider. We have to do something. And the response of Dr. Doom is no. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go home and I'm going to take care of my country. Reed Richards wanted to be the one to run the show, then let Reed Richards run the show. And if the entirety of the project goes awry and a black hole singularity opens at the moon, I will deal with it and I will take care of it, but I will take care of it because I'm better than he is. But I want the world to know that Reed Richards is a failure. I want the world to know that he's nowhere near as capable as I am. Literally, Dr. Doom is willing to potentially see the earth destroyed just to make Reed Richards Richards look bad. And so where this picks up is actually the first time they've spent any meaningful time together over the course of the story arc. Now, Doctor Doom and Kang have a history, a pretty lengthy history. And in fact, back in the day, and the original comic escapes me, but back in the day in Marvel, there was a point when Kang the Conqueror, after he adopted the identity of Ramatut and was defeated by the Fantastic Four in ancient Egypt, he ended up coming back to the modern era. And then after meeting Doctor Doom, basically fashioned a suit of his own that was similar to Doctor Doom and started calling himself the Scarlet Centurion, right? So just one of those little bits of history here. But the long and short of it is that these guys have a lot of respect for each other, but their egos are off the charts, right? They're like, they're like Dwayne Johnson cooking the books with Black Adam. The hierarchy of power in the DC universe is about to change, right? I mean, like, it's just a whole new level of ego. Like, that's literally what this is. And so that's why one of the first things they talk about here is whether or not they're actually related. And that's one of the things that's just kind of a big question that's existed in Marvel Comics for eons and eons. And the reason why is because Kane the Conqueror's real name is Nathaniel Richards. And of course you have Reed Richards and Reed Richards' father's name is Nathaniel Richards. So for years and years in Marvel Comics, and I mean, when I say years, I mean like decades, right? For like the last 50 years or so in Marvel Comics, give or take a little bit, fans always found themselves asking the question, is Kane the Conqueror, Nathaniel Richards, is he descended from Doctor Doom? Is he descended from Reed Richards? And in fact, they're going to pose this question as to whether or not Nathaniel Richards, right, Kane the Conqueror, is actually the father of Reed from like maybe a different universe or operating under a different change in his character's history or whatever the case happens to be. We'll talk about that here in a second because it gets a little wonky. But one of the things that happens here is that these guys are basically taking the long road.
road, right? Instead of just like teleporting somewhere or having some vessel from Latveria pick them up and take them where they need to be or Kane the Conqueror using technology. Instead, they literally have to lay low. So they're going old school, man. They're hitching rides and like train cars and like walking and stuff. It's cool. Unfortunately for a couple of these poor saps, these guys basically decide to stow away on one of the trains, literally hitch a ride. And then like one of them gets into the train car with Dr. Doom and Kang and is like, hey, what's going on, gentlemen? Do you guys mind sharing this train car with me? Now, if anybody who knows anything about Dr. Doom knows, this guy does not suffer vagrants. <laughs> so they blast him out of the train car and send that guy flying to his doom, right? After that, it picks up with the two of them just kind of there at like a campfire, right? And again, that's kind of how this conversation continues on. That what ends up happening is Dr. Doom even goes as far as to say, I've heard rumors that you're Reed Richard's father. And the response of, of Kang is, I've heard that too, but he looks nothing like me. Now, the reason why this is being thrown out here is because this goes back to Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, which we need to continue because if anything, after the, the after where we stopped, it's just a handful of like small ancillary stories, right? Just like one shots and little mini series. And it's Jonathan Hickman just kind of cleaning things up. So it's not essential by any standard of measurement, but it would be fun to go back, right? Because we still have Franklin Richards from the future who's currently in the present day doing his thing and crazy levels of reality warping and so on and so forth. Plus there's the ultimate fate of Ben Grimm, which is kind of screwed up. But the thing about this is that when Jonathan Hickman wrote the Fantastic Four and specifically when we got what was called the Big Hunt. So all these different variants of Nathaniel Richards, Reed's father, across the multiverse, all facing off against each other and jumping in and out of different universes, right? Age of Ultron, Days of Future Past, different things like that. That one of the big theories that rose to prominence during that time is that because Reed Richards' father's name is Nathaniel Richards, you had the Great Hunt, you have variants of Nathaniel, that they all end up becoming basically versions of Kang. And so that's where that theory came from initially, or really gained the most traction, I should say, is that Kang is potentially the father of Reed. So again, it's one of these really interesting things because when you're talking about a guy like Kang who does time travel, while he has a lot, uh, has had a lot of identities over the years, the reality of this is that Kang has actually forgotten a lot of the things that he's done over the course of his existence, right? A really good example of this, if you want to put this to the test, tell me what was on the wall on the left-hand side in your third grade class. What did your teacher have written on the wall? What was the name of your third grade teacher? And that's what you're talking about here, right? Kang the Conqueror jumps in and out of different points in time all the time, right? And so because of that, it all just kind of turns into an amorphous blob of things he's done. But that's why you'll have comics where somebody will say, well, Kang, what about the time that you did this? And he won't know what they're talking about because he will have forgotten it. And so again, it's just one of those interesting things when it comes to his character's history. So that's why the theory still holds traction. And that's why it's entirely true. But of course, following this, it's also Kang basically telling Doom, I'm not, I'm not your father. And the response to Doom is, I know you're not. <laughs> Perhaps I'm your father, right? Like it's one of the things where they kind of go back and forth. We never get any definitive answers. Truth to tell, I don't think Marvel will ever give us a definitive answer as to whether or not Kang is related to Reed Richards or to Dr. Doom, which one he's descended from. Because it's just one of those cool little mysteries that just kind of exists out there. Now, of course, following this, you have uh, you have another poor bastard that decides to roll up on Kang the Conqueror and Dr. Doom as they're walking down this uh, deserted highway. These two folks ride up on him, right? And one of them's like, so what do we got here, right? I ain't never seen more colorific looking chuckle ducks in all my life. What's your name, fancy Cleopatra? Referring to Kane the Conqueror. And they're like, how about you, Steely Dan? What's behind your Iron Curtain? And of course, Dr. Doom, in response to this, helps them finish with all their living. Anybody who is aware of Dr. Doom and even Kang knows, you don't just roll up on these guys talking smack like that, right? That's just something that you don't do. Otherwise, you will be made to meet your maker. <laughs> and that's literally it. But one of the coolest things about this, this is one of the reasons why I love this comic so much. One of the coolest things about this is that, again, there's a lot of respect between the two. Depending on the story arc, they're mortal enemies. But the reality here is that the intelligence of Dr. Doom can never be underestimated by anybody. Even Reed Richards and people like Valeria Richards, the daughter of Reed, who's every bit as smart as Dr. Doom and Reed himself. People like uh, Moon Girl, who's that intelligent, or even Adam Brashear, who's as intelligent, right? At least that's what this story solidified. They all basically go to Dr. Doom in some capacity as the guy that can answer questions that they have that they simply can't find answers to on their own. He's wildly intelligent. And that's one of the reasons that, that his character, even alongside Kang, is so cool. Because even Kang himself recognizes the intelligence of Doctor Doom and the reason why that needs to be respected. But Doctor Doom also respects Kang because between the two of them, they have an unwillingness to be defeated, to defy all the odds and to ensure they come out on top. More so than that, what Doctor Doom respects above all is one, a person's intelligence and a person's fortitude. How hard are you willing to work to get what you want? Do you take the easy road or do you take the hard road? 
even if the hard road doesn't need to be taken, do you take it anyway for no other reason than the fact that it'll make you more well-rounded and make you better. And Kane the Conqueror is very much the guy who will take the hard road. Everything he has, he worked for, with the exception of the time travel device. He, he stole that. I mean, truth to tell, let's be honest with ourselves, right? It was literally Dr. Doom's time platform in the 30th century and Kane just took it, right? But outside of that, outside of that, <laughs> the, guy, the guy is unwilling to give ground and will always do whatever it takes to win. And Doom can always respect that. And so that's why you have this, this kind of conversation where Doom asks the question, why are you even bothering to help me? And the response of, of Kang is, I explained, I will conquer the world that you save. And the response of Doom is, I will save no world. And again, Kang says, no, I've seen the utopia that you've created. And then the response of Doom is, you've also seen a future where Earth is overrun by a cohort of mechanized dinosaurs. And that's when Kang makes this amazing point and he says, true, still, wherever Dr. Doom stands, there exists a lust for power, one I can use to my advantage. And that's where Doom calls his bluff. And he says, honestly, I think you're just lonely. And the two of them just kind of start going back and forth. I am not, you're lonely. No, you're lonely. I'm not lonely because I'm Dr. Doom and I'm a misanthrope. Well, I'm more of a misanthrope, I'm a misanthrope times two. But it's literally just kind of this bickering back and forth and this sort of nonsensical and almost sort of a bromance that, that exists between these guys. I don't know if anybody uses that word anymore, but it's great to see Doom and Kang relating to each other in this way because more often than not, you see them as enemies. It's cool because literally after they, they share this laugh together, the response of Doom is, I will destroy you, Kang. And the response of Kang is, I'll destroy you first, Victor, right? So it's just one of those cool little moments that goes on there. Now, having said that, once they make their way to Texas, what ends up going on here is Dr. Doom has what he calls an ace in the hole in the sense that he was able to kind of contact people through a kind of underground network and say like, I need something delivered to me at this location. So at this point, they're literally just biding time and waiting when out of nowhere, they're met by the arrival of Paladin with a minigun who literally just starts spraying the whole place down. <laughs> literally, this guy's just standing there with a minigun unloading everything. Honestly, it looks like an M60, but he's just spraying everything down only for them to find out the way in which they were found was because of the orb. Now, here's a few things to explain here. Is Paladin an important character? No, Paladin sucks. He's always sucked. He's never been a relevant guy. There's never been an instance in the history of Marvel Comics when all these villains are all teaming up to face off against the heroes and they're losing and then Paladin shows up and the day's saved. That's never happened, right? The guy's about as irrelevant of a mercenary as anybody possibly can be. But more so than that, the orb, this guy's just downright goofy. But it is still cool to see that they have their history intact. So here's the thing. When it comes to the orb, this guy was completely and totally irrelevant in Marvel Comics until a story was written that was called Original Sin. And what this guy had done is he had discovered the dead body of the Watcher, which had actually been killed by Nick Fury. But he had taken one of the Watcher's eyes. And because everything the Watcher has seen over the course of his existence was stored inside of his eyes, the orb basically broadcast all that information to the world. So everybody learned everything about themselves that they had previously never known. A really good example of this is during, oh my God, John and Hickman's Avengers, New Avengers, when Captain America was originally part of the Illuminati during the incursions, when like the multiverse was collapsing and the Illuminati were talking about destroying alternate Earth, that when he disagreed, his mind was wiped by Doctor Strange at the direction of Iron Man, and then he was thrown out of the Illuminati. So he didn't know any of that stuff. But during Original Sin, all those memories were restored to him, and then he had lost his super soldier serum and just became this crotchety old son of a gun and was literally going like, like going after the Illuminati. Like he took over S.H.I.E.L.D. and brought like the full might of the U.S. military and the intelligence community on to like find the Illuminati. It was amazing, man, because for a time, Captain America was kind of a warlord and it was pretty boss. Like it was amazing. <laughs> It's one of the best moments in the history of Marvel Comics. But again, the orb still has one of the Watcher's eyes. Now, the Watcher himself is back, right? But the orb still has one of his eyes, meaning the orb sees all. Like, literally, he has, like, what you could argue to be cosmic awareness, although there's nothing to indicate that it operates on a universal level. But literally, like, with the hunt for Doom, it's Doom's over there in Texas, right? He knows right off the bat. And so what ends up happening is Kang brandishes really one of his older weapons, which is called the Ultra Diode. But what it does is it basically just saps people of their willpower. So it reduces you down to the most pathetic version of yourself, right? So most people on Twitter and Reddit, and the result of this is that these guys just kind of cower into like a fetal position and just sort of cry about how like the end is nigh, their lives don't serve any useful purpose or anything like that. But the cool thing here is that once the this plane, right, this contact lands and Dr. Doom is given his ace in the hole, that what we end up finding out is that it's actually the ultimate nullifier. Now here's the thing, man, and I'm kind of amazed that Christopher Cantwell's just sort of treating this as a thing.
thing, right? Like, it's just sort of there. The ultimate nullifier is quite literally the ultimate weapon in Marvel, right? I mean, I would argue this thing is way beyond the power of an Infinity Gauntlet. Because the thing about the ultimate nullifier is that the power that it possesses is relative to the person who's using it. Initially, it was created by Galactus, and then it was attained by the Fantastic Four during the original Galactus trilogy. Literally, Johnny Storm and the Watcher go to Galactus's ship, Tatu. They steal it, they bring it back to Earth, they give it to Reed, and then Reed starts brandishing this thing in Galactus's face, and then Galactus just flees for his life. That's a very simplified version of what happens. <laughs> but like, this thing scares the hell out of Galactus. And the reason why is because if you put the ultimate nullifier in the hands of an idiot, it may not necessarily work. You put this thing in the hand of Reed Richards, you could annihilate the universe. Dr. Doom, you could wipe out the whole universe. The benefit of the ultimate nullifier is that it doesn't just destroy whatever you aim it at, it basically makes it so it never existed. So a really good example of this is that if Dr. Doom were to point the ultimate nullifier at Spider-Man, then Spider-Man would simply cease to exist. Not only that, it would be as if he never existed. So seemingly, nobody would have ever heard of Spider-Man, nobody would have ever, like, any images of Spider-Man that exist would ultimately be gone, right? They would just disappear. Like, this guy, the, the entire evidence of this guy's existence would vanish forever. That's really the major implication of the ultimate nullifier, and there's really no way to bring them back. So that's why I say, I mean, presumably, you could point this thing at, like, the Infinity Gauntlet or any cosmic entities, probably even the Living Tribunal, maybe, I'm not really sure, I guess it just kind of depends, but the thing is insanely powerful. So the fact that it's in the possession of Doctor Doom means this guy means business, man, and so what ends up happening is that once he has the ultimate nullifier, we end up finding out this is the reason why Kang was here in the first place. That the reality here is that Kang wanted to attain the nullifier for himself, but unless he decided to screw up the time stream, Doctor Doom had to get his hands on it in order for Kang to take it from Doctor Doom. Things have to happen in a certain order when it comes to the progression of time throughout the universe. And so as soon as Doctor Doom gets the ultimate nullifier, Kang turns on him and then steals the ultimate nullifier. But before he can get away, this is the crazy thing, before he can get away, Doctor Doom quite literally stabs Kang the Conqueror in the neck. Like literally stabs him in the neck, right? Blood goes everywhere, leaves him for dead, and then just takes off on his horse, right? Just like rides off on his horse. And so following that, Dr. Doom basically ends up getting to Mexico. And when he arrives there, which is kind of weird to see, he ends up basically grabbing a payphone and he calls Reed Richards from a payphone. And the reason why is because during the time when Doom and Kang were traveling together, the question that they had is, how do we do, how do we end that black hole? And they were asking questions like, can we use antimatter? It's like, well, antimatter is still composed of mass. So literally mass plus mass equals more mass. So if you fire some kind of antimatter cannon at a black hole, all it's going to do is just absorb all that mass and grow bigger. You're not going to do anything but feed it. And so that's where Doom's mind began to sort of look over the entirety of the situation. That's when he calls up Reed Richards and he says, your black hole solution is simple, Reed. My guess is that it's standing right next to you. And he says, Brashear, the blue marvel, send him inside the Antleon experiment. Now the initial response of Reed is an antimatter collision will just create more mass. And the response of Dr. Doom is, listen, you idiot, right? He says, send him past the event horizon. He can generate a massive amount of negative energy to dissipate the black hole. I know he survived the nuclear explosion, so there's a chance the singularity will not incinerate him. And then he ultimately leaves. Now, here's the reason why that would work. Remember, Adam Brashear is an antimatter reactor, right? He literally, he's basically a guy that draws all of his power from the antimatter universe. So imagine, how, you know how like Superman draws his power from the sun, right? Solar energy gives him all of his abilities, like it feeds his abilities. That's what happens with Adam, Bra Adam Brashear. Instead of him being fed by the power of the sun, he's fed by a whole different universe. But it's also why his power is seemingly limitless. Because so long as the negative zone exists, he'll be powerful. And he could presumably channel all the power of the negative zone in different forms and fashions. It's why when it comes down to like physical strength, Adam Brashear is arguably the single strongest character in the Marvel Universe. The best way to test that, and I hope Marvel gives it to us one day, I want to see Blue Marvel versus like World Breaker Hulk. I want to see that fight because that would be dope. But literally, because he's an antimatter reactor, that's the response of Dr. Doom. I'm not a physicist, so I don't really even know how all this works. But as I understand it, it would basically be two objects hitting and just canceling each other out, right? Negative one plus positive one equals zero. That's really what this would be. So I'm kind of curious to see exactly how this would play out. Well, the way this picks up is it picks up with Adam Brashear, the Blue Marvel, basically traveling into the black hole for the purpose of using 
using its power to try to cancel out the black hole and then literally dissipate it is basically what would happen. For Dr. Doom, he's returning to Latveria now. So what we're gonna do here is, is with the Adam Bashir portion, it's not overly necessary at this point in time, but the whole gist behind this is that as he travels into the black hole, that the mission again is for him to basically expound as much of his energy as he possibly can, literally channel it outward inside the event horizon of the black hole, or really inside the singularity, and then basically collapse the black hole and then make it out before he's ultimately destroyed. Now, obviously this is a Marvel comic. It's defying all laws of physics as we know them <laughs> because nothing escapes a black hole. That's the significance of a black hole. So as, as Adam Brashear gets into this, there's a few things that happen. One, he's met by an alternate reality version of Otto Octavius. And that's when we end up finding out these different visions that, uh, that Dr. Doom has been having over the course of this story where he has like a different life. He basically leads the world into a, a kind of scientific age of enlightenment, really, where he has like a wife and children and so on. That's what's on the other side of this black hole. It's a wormhole is really what it is, right? It's a tunnel that leads from the main Marvel universe to this alternate reality. And that what's been happening is Dr. Doom has been receiving visions from this alternate reality of what his life in that universe looks like. But the other part of this, and for reasons that I'll never fully understand Christopher Cantwell invokes the brood right so like this crazy looking alien race like attacks and of course Adam Brashear basically fights them off but it also leads to uh Dr. Octopus being killed in the process right this alternate reality Otto Octavius being killed but before we find out what really happens there what we end up doing is jumping back to Victor Von Doom right now with his arrival in Latveria you do have what are basically is kind of inner council right so you got Boris you got Petra Laren a few other people but you also have Christoph Bernard now the reason why these guys matter is because one, Christoph Renard is the heir to the throne. So as soon as this coup d'etat happened, Christoph Renard was like public enemy number two. Dr. Doom, of course, being public enemy number one because he was still alive out there somewhere. But Christoph Renard is like the adopted child of Dr. Doom. And in fact, he's gone so far over the course of his publication history to take his own mind and use Christoph Renard as a backup for it. So as we saw in Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, for example, if something happened to Dr. Doom and he he lost his level of intelligence, he could download his mind from Christoph Renard, and it would be like restoring your PC, right? That's literally what it is here. And so Christoph Renard is so important because he's the rightful heir to Latveria. Now you've also got Zora, also known as Victorious. She was at one point a kind of herald to a degree of Galactus when he showed up on Earth, but has largely been like the number two in terms of Doctor Doom's control of the military and so on, one of his most trusted confidants. But that's really what's happening here, is because when they're out there just kind of surviving and whatnot, and Dr. Doom shows up on the scene. It's Dr. Doom riding a bear, which is probably one of the most baller things that I think I've ever seen Dr. Doom. I mean, he just looks menacing, right? Like literally he's like riding a bear and he's like, I have returned. And like, you see that and you're like, yep, he's returned. And we're not gonna argue with that, are we guys? And it's like, nope, we're not gonna argue with that at all because the dude is riding a bear and none of us wants to die. Not only that, his bear is his pet. He named him, right? Like literally his name is Novak. <laughs> and it's not even his pet. He's like, this is my comrade Novak. See that he's fed, right? So like, it's one of those cool things because for all the, the, the pomp and circumstance and all the arrogance that Dr. Doom puts out there to the world, the reality here is he's gooey on the inside, right? Like he's, he's gooey, soft, right? gentle he's 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 got a little a little bit of uh what is sensitivity on the inside there right so it's you wouldn't know it right but it's one of those those funny things so as soon as he arrives here what he says and literally addressing his inner council is he's like this coup d'etat originated from inside uh latveria as far as i'm aware and of course it started in Simkaria. but the reality here is that i ruled this country with trust i trusted my people i trusted that they would not overthrow me now he does trust to a degree, but he also recognizes they could do that. And in fact, that was highlighted in Hickman's uh, Avengers and New Avengers when he was talking, oh my God, when he was talking to Namor the Submariner in one of the best moments ever. So literally like when the multiverse is falling apart and after Namor the Submariner had made his alliance with like Thanos and all those guys, only to find out that Thanos is exactly what we thought he was, which was just a crazy guy that loves to kill stuff. He abandons the cabal. He shows up at Dr. Doom's doorstep and is like, you've got to help me. And Dr. Doom's like, uh, okay, so here's the thing, Namor. I'm a king. You were a king once upon 
upon a time, you understand the bigger picture here, right? Like, do you really think the people in Latveria wouldn't kill me if they chose to? Of course they would. He's like, but uh, I feed them and I protect them. I keep them safe from whatever threats are out there. So before they, they pray to whatever God they believe in when they go to sleep at night, they give thanks to me. It's like one of the greatest speeches ever, right? And then he tells Namor the Submariner, you're on your own, right? You threw in your lot with Reed Richards and then you went to Thanos and now you show up on my doorstep asking me for help? No, sir. Dr. Doom is no one's second choice. He literally just rejects him just because of the fact that he felt like he was his second choice. It was an amazing moment in, in Marvel Comics. But the thing about this is that uh, as he talks to them, he does know that at any point in time, his own citizenry could literally rise up against him. But it's the fact that it's happened that now he questions everybody. So he tells them all, you're going to prove to me that I should trust you. And as each person goes in turn and provides their own swearing of loyalty to Dr. Doom. We meet up with a guy named Vasily uh, Mikheyev, I think is how you pronounce his name. And it's one of these things because as Dr. Doom starts asking him questions like, you know, how in the world do you think this happened? How do you think this, this whole coup took place? The response of, of Vasily as well as obviously traitors in our midst, right? Subverting our security, different things like that. And Doom says, allow me to read you something. And what ended up happening here is that Dr. Doom reads a letter that was written by Vasily to basically a woman named Katarina who is a Simkarian. And so that's when Dr. Doom and really Vasily starts to realize Dr. Doom already knows Vasily's one of the traitors, that he's one of the people who worked against Dr. Doom in order to orchestrate, uh, orchestrate the coup d'etat in Latveria. And so once this comes to fruition, Vasily can't really lie. Like he can't really make anything up, right? It's, at this point, if Dr. Doom asks him, what do you know about this letter? Assume it's rhetorical. Assume he already knows the answer. And so that's when Vasily is just like, okay, right? The jig is up. Like there's nothing he could do. And Dr. Doom tells him, I'll give you a two minute running start. This guy hauls ass out the door because he knows Dr. Doom well enough to know he's not messing around. Dr. Doom walks out there and at 1 minute 59 seconds the clock strikes 2 minutes he fires the shot and kills Vasily on the spot and then he's like feed him to my bear and like that's it that's how dr doom gets things done guys right it's it's i love how he's handled i love the way christopher cantwell writes dr doom here it's absolutely phenomenal but the other part of this is he actually ends up meeting with victorious now he knows victorious well enough to know there's no way she'd be involved in a coup d'etat against him right so for for you know to a degree she kind of gets a pass but what he does is he presents her with the ultimate nullifier and says the ultimate nullifier takes an astronomical focus mind in order to use it otherwise the user will destroy themselves or accidentally cause any manner of things to come to an end so i'm giving it to you to hold on to for safekeeping because my mind is not as focused as it used to be but then following that he travels directly to his castle in latveria and it's one of the coolest moments because when the coup d'etat took place a guy named dmitry fortunov was basically put in charge of latveria as the new ruler of the kingdom he's more of a puppet than anything else kind of the guy who's there to make it look like he's running the show when in reality he's just being told what to do so basically any american politician and the reality of this is that when dr doom shows up he's just kind of like the ruler of latveria an impressive title dimitri right an impressive title you must carry it with dignity stand up straight after all your king and hold your head high he who reigns looks down on those who don't but something's missing yes a true leader must have this and that's when dr doom removes his helmet and shows his face and says if you are going to be the leader of latveria this is what you must look like and he forces this guy to start cutting his own face up right to disfigure his own face and then he turns he says the ruler of latveria must also be a god dimitri right can you fly as a god flies and then he throws him over the banisters and the guy falls to his death and he's like alas a mere mortal quite the pity but then in that moment he actually ends up getting a vision of his kids from the alternate reality but they've cut their faces up to look like him and the view of it is so astronomically crushing to him that he actually sort of collapses on the spot right he almost passes out from the strain because remember these visions that he has of his kids of the life that he could have it's what he aspires to it's what he wants it's almost like this life is unsullied by everything that exists out there in the world right now and so what he does is he kind of gives us this little bit of a monologue 
where he says that over time, you know, once he was met by Victorious, and I wouldn't say nursed back to health, but Victorious was able to help him regain his bearings, Doctor Doom basically sits, like, he literally takes his throne back. And with him having the ultimate nullifier, one of the things to understand is the world is scared out of its wits now. Under any normal circumstance, the world would look at Doctor Doom retaking Latveria with a bit of a questionable eye and just kind of be like, can we really trust this guy? But the dude's got the ultimate nullifier in his possession. And Doctor Doom, as far as the world is concerned, albeit the world doesn't know the current goings on of his mental state, but Doctor, but the world sees Doctor Doom and believes this guy having the ultimate nullifier is enough to literally wipe out the entirety of the universe. Like, that in the blink of an eye and so no one really questions what it is that he wants and in fact he goes as far as to say like now that i've taken my throne back i don't want to conquer the world i don't want to take over the world i have no grand aspirations for anything like that but what i am going to do is i'm going to put down this rebellion that had taken place in latveria i'm going to route out everybody who was from sincaria that caused this coup d'etat in the first place and then i'm going to take sincaria and that's going to be it and the world doesn't stand in his way so literally this guy launches an attack against the neighboring country. And let me tell you something, man. This guy, son, 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 they, they were not prepared. This guy comes in and it's just like, it's, it's hell, it's fire and brimstone, right? It's Old Testament, man. This guy comes in and he's literally like, I seized control of this entire country. I conquered everything, right? He says like the Simkarian invasion was over quickly. My blood became charged with the verve as we stamped out every conspiratorial smudge of scum, every whisper of usurping vermin. I even dusted off my old blaster buggy, which is an actual thing that he used to have back in the day. I haven't driven in ages. What fun it was to lay waste to so much at such invigorating speeds. Here was doom at his greatest. I am a strong proponent of total war and no quarter. If you're going to break the back of an entire nation, you might as well do it right. We even killed most of the livestock. They just clean slated Simkaria. And it was as much of a message as it was anything else. This guy goes full on Kaiser Sose, right? I, I don't know if we ever ran over that, right? But like Kaiser Sose, the story of Kaiser Sose is amazing, right? We're going to kind of scroll comment panel so you guys to see what's going on. But the story of Kaiser Sose is amazing. Because for those of you guys who never heard about this, it was from the usual suspects, right? And it's literally Kevin Spacey who gives the story and he says that Kaiser Sose was just like this drug runner, right? This guy that ran like a small little drug operation and that was it. But you had these, these Hungarian warlords that wanted to basically make a name for themselves. And what they knew is that true power is not how much you have and how much you control. It's about your willingness to do what the other guy won't. So these Hungarian warlords, I think they were Hungarian, basically show up at uh, Kaiser Sose's home. They find his wife and kids, right? They basically do what they will with his family. And when Kaiser Sose gets back, he finds his wife has been violated and his kids are crying. And so these guys literally tell him, we want your whole operation. We want it all. We want the drugs, the money. We want your contacts, the whole nine yards, right? They wanted to show Kaiser Sose that they were, that they were men of will, that they were willing to do whatever it took. And so Kaiser Sose showed these men of will just what will really was. This guy killed his wife and his kids. And then he executed every single one of the Hungarian warlords except for one. And then he let that guy go and tell the tale. And then once all these guys, like once, once his family was buried, then he goes to work, right? He killed these Hungarian warlords' parents. He killed their parents' friends. He burned down the homes that they lived in. He burned down the businesses they worked out of. He killed the people who owed them money. And then he vanished. And that was it, right? You never found out what happened to Kaiser Sose after that. Well, you do, but you got to watch the usual suspects to find out. That's literally what this is, man. That's literally what this is. It's like that guy said to John Lithgow in that movie Ricochet. You didn't beat him. You just pissed him off. And now you fuck, because now he's going to be out for blood. And so what we end up doing here is we basically switch over to Dr. Doom basically finding Katarina right after the letter that he read to Vasily. He ends up taking one of his swords. Him and Katarina get in a sword fight. He cuts her down and that's the end of it. Following that, Katarina tells him, I'm not the one who started the coup d'etat in Latveria from Sincaria. I'm not the one who caused it. Instead, she points him to the, to the person who did. And what he ends up revealing is that it's a woman he's never met. He doesn't know who she is, doesn't know what she's about. But ultimately, these people launched the rebellion against against Dr. Doom from some from some Karia to seize control of Latveria and that this woman herself had a daughter and the daughter that she had was basically left behind when this woman fled after her husband was killed. This woman's been in Simkaria ever since and been plotting to overthrow Dr. Doom. But her daughter was taken by the rebel forces that sided with Dr. Doom and then raised as their own. 
the girl is victorious. That literally the number one, really the number two commander of Dr. Doom's army actually has some Karian blood. Now, Victorious wasn't working against Dr. Doom. And in fact, she didn't even know her own heritage. She didn't know that this woman who had orchestrated this whole coup in Latveria was her own mom. She had no idea that was the case. And so instead, what Dr. Doom does really with, uh, with uh, Zora herself is he orders her to kill this woman after telling Victorious that this woman is her mom. And while Victorious does follow the orders as they were given to her, at the end of the day, Dr. Doom assumed that Victorious wouldn't really care that she would just see this woman as Simkarian scum, as a rebel, right? A person who tried to orchestrate a revolt. Instead, while it doesn't necessarily lead Victorious to turning against Dr. Doom entirely, it does permanently fracture the relationship between the two of them. She doesn't trust him as much anymore, and she doesn't look at him the same way anymore. Following that, every single person who was in some capacity as, you know, associated with the coup d'etat in Latveria from Sincaria, whether they're in Latveria as, as collaborators and orchestrators, or whether they're from Simkaria or not, it doesn't matter. They're all summarily executed by firing squad. So literally, like, Dr. Doom takes no prisoners. And the funny thing about this, as this kind of final act, is what he does is he muses to himself, and he says, despite all this violence and all these things that he's done, at the end of the day, he has no intention of staying this way. That what he's going to do is he's going to travel to the moon, he's going to find a solution to fix this whole Antleon Collider problem, and then he's going to become the version of himself that he saw in his visions. The version of himself that by all standards of measurement is much better and far more peaceful than he is right now and has led the world into a place where it becomes more more advanced right basically ushering uh, ushering in a new era but notice this dr doom's not doing it because it's the right thing to do none of it comes from an altruistic motive he's doing it because he sees it as his best possible chance to rule the world. And so following this, once he completes all of his research and everything and literally develops a plan, that what he says is he's kind of devised a whole like laser and experiment and so on, which is way beyond my ability to comprehend. But basically it keeps getting fired into the black hole, which will help to reduce the black hole in size. The problem with this is that Dr. Doom's ego becomes his own problem. That what happens here is that as he talks to Reed Richards, who literally just wants to wish him good luck, Dr. Doom's own ego and really his own self consciousness consciousness starts to become an issue when he starts to believe that Reed has an ulterior motive. That Reed's just like, yeah, good luck, Dr. Doom. You're going to need it, man. Because maybe Reed Richards has realized something about Dr. Doom's experiment that Dr. Doom didn't realize himself. But because of how much he hates Reed, and because of all the insecurity that he has in this comparison to Reed, that he actually starts recalculating all of his experiments. He basically starts to second guess himself. And when that happens, he makes a fatal error. Because when he does, the machine fires off, it hits the moon and it blows part of the moon in half and then following that dr doom disappears and so when that happens he basically wakes up in this alternate reality in this alternate universe where he's met by his alternate self and this is where things get really really cool because as he meets this alternate reality version of himself he doesn't really attack him right instead he's just like i want to learn i want to know how it was you successfully managed to conquer the world now notice the conversation between these two is starkly different because this good version of doom right this we'll call him victor right victor does not use phrases like here's how i conquer the world here's how i subjugated humanity different things like that it's we and us it's a collaborative effort from his perspective whereas dr doom is seeing it as you did something that allowed you to seize control of the entire world and it's one of those cool things because adam brashear survived everything that had gone on and in fact he ended up in this alternate reality as well and what what really uh adam brashear says is that the visions that dr doom has been having of victor's life where he's got a wife and kids and the world world adores him and loves him, that the reality is it's a mirror, that what Victor's been receiving are the is, is really the life of Dr. Doom. And so it's one of those things where Victor looks at Dr. Doom and his actions in the main Marvel Universe and being a, a, a kind of warlord and all that kind of stuff as a nightmare, right? He sees it as like the worst possible version of himself that he could potentially be. Whereas Dr. Doom looks at Victor and sees Victor as what could be the best version of himself. But again, the motivations are different. Victor is afraid of the life that he would have as Dr. Doom because he becomes a warlord. Dr. Doom loves the life that Victor has because it allows him to achieve his, his ultimate goal 
as a warlord. So again, totally different motivations, totally different perspectives, but at the end of the day, they are in some capacity mirrors of each other. And that's what's so cool here, because as they begin to talk, this Victor personality kind of starts to rub off on Dr. Doom to a degree, right? Where Dr. Doom is perceiving all of this as Victor just because he's so much smarter than everybody. And like, that's it. But one of the things Victor says is, you're wrong about that. And I wanna hear you say that you're wrong. I wanna hear you tell me that you were wrong. And the response of Doom is, I was wrong, right? And it's really hard for him to say because he's got to swallow his pride to do it. But then they get to the home of Victor, which is a really nice and beautiful home, but it's not the castle of Doomstadt in Latveria. And Dr. Doom asks Victor, like, why would you give up our birthright? Why would you give up this castle to live in this 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 kind of, this hovel, as he calls it, right? Like this, this small home that just does not really stand as a testament to the greatness of who we are. And the response of Victor is, because none of this is about how great I am. None of this is about how awesome and intelligent I as Victor Von Doom am. That's not what this is supposed to be. This was all done for the legitimate betterment of humanity, to make the world a better place for people. More so than that, what he also says is, you are looking at this and you're really looking at the world from your own limited perspective. You look at it in terms of what you can make the world into being. I look at the world from the perspective of what can I and the rest of humanity turn the world into? What can we make the world? Because it's one of those things where he says the result is that regardless of how you perceive humanity, whether you're exceedingly misanthropic and make this argument that the human race is the worst thing to happen to Earth, or you're more optimistic where you say the potential of humanity far outweighs the terrible things that we've done, the reality is that the human race is greater than the sum of its parts. As a singular entity with a singular ideology and a motive, the human race cannot be stopped from achieving anything, but instead it's it's literally barriers between countries and it's motivations from world leaders, right, and different things like that. It's the limited perception of the world by humanity that makes humanity so limited. And so when he's like, once you start breaking that down, the possibilities are endless. And what he reveals is it's like, this isn't just Earth where this happens. The, every single race across the universe, we all collaborate now. The Shi'ar, the Kree, the Scroll, the Badoon, the whole nine yards, we share information, we share technology, that we protect those civilizations as much as they protect us. And while our technology was vastly more limited than theirs, because humanity as a whole had not achieved interstellar travel, there was a level of power regarding various superheroes that exist on Earth that those other other civilizations didn't have. So we let them have some stuff, they let us have some stuff, and the universe is better off for it. And that's what's so fascinating here, because even Victor says, like, all these grand weapons that exist out there, and these grand powers, the Infinity Stones, the Cosmic Cube, the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, you know, the, the Casket of Ancient Winters, the Darkhold, there's no need for those things anymore. There's no need for these crazy, you know, artifacts of power, because nobody really views the world in such a limited capacity in that way anymore. We don't need it. We do what's right because it's best for humanity. And so as this whole conversation takes place, that what Victor tells Dr. Doom is, you can achieve this. You can do this on your own home world. You can literally bring this world or really bring what I've done to your own world, but you're going to have to drop this facade. You're going to have to drop this armor that you have. You're going to have to learn to forgive guys like Richards, and you're going to have to heal your face. And he says, the reason why you have to heal your face is because you know just as well as I do, at any point in time, you could heal your face. You could restore your face back to a sense of normalcy, but you choose not to, because having a scarred face allows you to remember how humanity has wronged you. That instead of becoming one with humanity and leading humanity, you want to subjugate the human race because you see yourself as better than them. You are the very definition of a misanthropic narcissist, right? Like you believe people don't matter and they should be subjected or sub, uh, subjugated because you're somehow more capable than they are. And he says, think about it for a moment, Victor. It's all a farce, a desperate and honestly pathetic attempt to conceal your endless fear. It currently permeates every fiber of your existence all the way down to the silly finger guns in your metal gauntlet hand. It's all ludicrous. Your entire mode of being is ludicrous. You know that I'm right. And when he says that, it's the final straw. Dr. Doom kills Victor on the spot. Then he seizes control of the ultimate nullifier in this alternate reality and wipes out the whole universe. Literally, 
kills the whole universe on the spot. He ends up having, you know, taking Adam Brashear out and Adam Brashear arrives back on Earth. But Doctor Doom is just like, no, I will not have it said that I, Doctor Doom, Victor Von Doom, the smartest being in existence, has somehow joined the limited intellectual minds of humanity and I've somehow become a part of them. I don't want to be infected by the human race. I don't want to be that kind of a person. If the human race will become better, it's because I will make them better. I will lead them into becoming better because I will subjugate them and turn them into something better. But if humanity could be better, it would have already been better by now. Humanity doesn't want to be better because people are stupid, but I will make them better. And so it's, it's like the most misanthropic thing ever, right? But literally, wipes out a whole universe on the spot, kills that entire universe, and then just goes back to his castle, and it's just like, nope, I'm him. Like, I'm, I'm Dr. Doom. There's not one ounce of good in me, and there never, ever will be. And that's when Kang reappears to Victor Von Doom, and it's just like, so I see that you're back on your throne. And the response of Victor is, yes, I will not become that guy. He is a weak, mewling, pathetic version of me, and that's never going to be what's going to happen to Dr. Doom. If I conquer this world, it'll be with an iron fist. And all, all Kang the Conqueror does is just look on and basically smile. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if it was the manipulation of Kang that led to this, but seemingly Kang always knew how this was going to turn out. It was simply just up to Dr. Doom to figure it out on his own. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Amazing story. I loved it. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.